welcome everybody to the next episode of Chiefs Focus First and Ten Live. You are here with JP, and we got a special guest on. We got Tim Grunhart, the man, the myth, the legend. How are you doing, my friend? JP, I'm doing great. It's great to see you again. Uh, excited yeah. to be on with you guys. I know you guys do such a great job with your podcast, and you guys have a lot of great followers, a lot of people that tune in, and uh, thank you for having me, and excited to talk a little bit about the Chiefs and the new book. Yeah, man. I, you know what? Uh, I appreciate you sending me the book, and I appreciate all the accolades there. We, uh, we were really excited to get your book. I was very excited to get it. Strangely enough, I have had zero time lately, and I've, I've read through parts of it and, you know, the beginning of it. And I knew a lot of your story anyway, um, given the fact. But I wanted to see what you had to say and how you uh, – what, what even – I mean, it's kind of crazy. What even brought you to um, write a book? I mean, it's, it's kind of, I didn't expect it. So <laughs> yeah, JP, not a lot of people did. You know, I, I joke all the time. I said, I wrote a book before I read one. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know what, uh, we were kind of sitting around and, uh, it was, you know, COVID kind of kicked in and, uh, you know, we were all kind of just hunkered down. And uh, my wife said to me, she goes, you, know, you got a lot of good stories. You do a lot of good radio stuff. She said, you ought to put it down on paper. And, uh, you know, I kind of thought about it. I said, oh, it just sounds like a lot of work. And, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple, couple of weeks later, a, a buddy of mine, just out of the blue, David Smale, who uh, has written a lot of books, said, hey, you know, are you interested in writing a book? I said, it's funny you say that because, yes, I am. I have a lot of good things I'd like to talk about. And, so uh, to make a long story short, uh, you know, we put together an outline uh, and then uh, I put together pages and pages of yellow uh, notebook paper with uh, stories and antidotes and everything else. And uh, we kind of worked together and put this thing uh, uh, on paper uh, for about four or five months uh, uh, last winter and into the spring and uh, was able to uh, secure a publisher and triumph out of Chicago and uh, you know, it was great. Uh, you know, it really was good for me because it reminded me of not only of how blessed and how lucky I am to have been with the Chiefs organization, but also reminded me that there's so many special people that have been in my life, not only with the Kansas City Chiefs, but, uh, you know, Kansas City Chief fans and just people I've run across throughout my life. So it was a great, great time and a great uh, uh, experiment for us, for lack of a better word to put some things on paper. And I think people have enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was really surprised when I said, you know, cause I, I remember everything that you did on the football field. And I have to say, I mean, honestly, standing on the sideline, you scared me. Um, I, mean, I don't think people realize how intimidating you were on the field and it, it, it translated to other players. And that's the one thing that I, I would remember is that as an offensive lineman, usually, you know, you, you got intimidation, but then there's you, there was only a few guys that could do that. You were one of them. Willie was one of them. I mean, it was just guys that just scared the hell out of opposing defenses. I mean, and plus, I mean, you're like fourth all time in chiefs, you know, with would you play 169 games, something like that. Um, I, I, that's kind of amazing in its own right, because usually, as you know, I mean, you feel it every day, uh, offensive linemen get beat up. I mean, it's a tough, gritty, hard job, and you were able to withstand it for a very long period of time. And looking at you now, it's a little uh, frustrating because you're two years older than I am, and you look way better than I do, um, condition-wise. Um, but, I mean, you've done – you know, the book is great. I, I, I hope everybody uh, goes out and gets a copy of this because it's, uh, it's pretty insightful. If you weren't around and you really didn't get to see the inside scoop of anything and what these guys – not only went through it, how, you know, how they got there and um, everything that just transpired during that time frame. It's, it's pretty interesting to find out it's, it, or to read about it. Now I noticed you had Carl Peterson involved in this project. Um, how did that come together? Yeah. So, you know, uh, Carl obviously drafted me in yeah. 1990. I, I talked a little bit about the draft process. Uh, you know, I played guard in college, never played center. And uh, so went to the combine and Howard Mudd, who was my offensive line coach, rest in peace, great man who yeah. uh, passed away a couple of years ago from a motorcycle accident. But um, so 
you know, I wasn't quite sure what I was. I didn't know if I was a guard or a, or a center or what it was. So uh, went to um, went to the combine and, and had a pretty decent combine, but met with Carl Peterson, met with Marty Schottenheimer, uh, sat and communicated and talked to him, got up on the board and did some stuff. And, and uh, they seemed to like what I had to say, and they seemed to like that I understood some of the concepts that the Chiefs were running at the time, but I never really heard from them. So, you know, a couple of weeks before the draft, I get a call from the 49ers and they asked me to fly out. And uh, I go out to San Francisco and I talk about this in the book. And, and, and here, you know, a guy that I was really about a, maybe a fourth rounder, fifth rounder, kind of in that area. And uh, Bob McKittrick, who was the offensive line coach for the 49ers, and, and Seifert was a head coach. And we sat down with them and he said, hey, listen, we're going to draft you in the first round. And I, and I looked at him. I thought, are these guys crazy? Do they know who they're talking to? <laughs> I mean, and they're like, yeah, we want you to play center. Jesse Sapolo is getting a little bit older. And we want you to come in here, learn from Jesse for a couple of years, and then take over and play a center for us. And I'm like, that's great. So I go back to South Bend. I go back to Notre Dame. And I tell everybody, listen, I'm going to be a 49er. Well, fast forward to draft day. And they call me and say, hey, we just want to make sure this is, you know, this is the phone and, you know, the connection's right. And we're going to be calling you last pick in the first round. And, and I'm all excited. And then the first round came around. The 49ers picked. They picked Dexter Carter. Yeah. Receiver out of Florida State. And I'm like, oh, well, damn. So I get, a, <laughs> I get a call right away. And they're like, oh, we didn't know Dexter Carter was going to be there. But, hey, listen, we're going to take you in the second round. It's a done deal. You know, it just kind of fell to us and our, our, you know, we fought for you, but, you know, they wanted to get Dexter, get some speed. And I'm like, listen, guys, I, you know, I was going to be fourth or fifth round anyway. Second round is just fine. I'm not too worried about it. Just want to be on a team. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, about an hour, an hour and a half later, I get a phone call and it's Carl Peterson. He said, Tim Grunhardt, Carl Peterson. <laughs> I said, uh, hello? He's like, uh, we just selected you at the 40th pick in the 1990 draft, and you'll be coming to Kansas City. We'll have a plane uh, ready to pick you up there and, and uh, the next day, and we're going to bring you in for a red coder deal. And, and I was like, hold on. So this is the Kansas City Chiefs, right? <laughs> He's like, yes, it is. And I got out with Marty, and I got out with Howard. And Howard said, I wasn't going to let you go. You are my guy, blah, blah. So, you know, so – all of a sudden, I was a Kansas City Chief. And, I, I, and seriously, I hung the phone up, and I turned to my girlfriend, now my wife, Sarah, and I said, where the hell is Kansas City at? <laughs> <laughs> I said, is it in Kansas or Missouri? And, J.D., yeah. I still not, I'm still not sure. And I've been yeah, here for yeah. a year. So. There's a white line. So, I mean, the white line, you cross it, and you're in one side or the other. side. That's right. So, I got here to Kansas City, and everything's been great. But real quick story there. So, I didn't know I was going to play guard or center. I'm sitting in my locker, and. Howard Mudd comes up spinning the football and, and throws it to me and said, hey, you're playing center. And I said, <laughs> you know I never played center before. He goes, well, you're going to today. And I said, okay. He goes, I want you to go and do a couple snaps with Steve DeBerg. You remember Bergie? Yeah. And Bergie was, you know, he's an older guy. And, and, yeah. and literally, I wasn't sure what he looked like because I wasn't a Chiefs fan. I didn't know anything about Steve yeah. DeBerg. Uh, and uh, so I went to Jonathan Hayes, who was sitting next to me. I knew Jonathan because of Jay. Jay Hayes was, was a coach of mine at Notre Dame. Yeah. So Jonathan was like the one guy that I knew. So I, I said, I said, Jonathan, I said, which one is Steve DeBerg? He goes, ah, <laughs> oh, you rookies. He's the guy laying down over there on the other side. I said, that old guy laying on the ground, that's the quarterback? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, yeah. So I took the ball over to, I said, I was like, do I call him Steve? Do I call him Bergy? Do I call him Mr. Berg? So I, of course, I went to Mr. DeBerg. I said, Mr. DeBerg, uh, Howard wants me to take a couple snaps with you. And I put this in the book, and he gets up, and you hear all the bones cracking, and, and he's all just sore and gets up, and he goes, all right. And I did literally one snap. He goes, oh, you're fine. I'll see you. <laughs> and I walked back to my locker, and I said, this is going to be a crap show here. I went on my own. Yeah. never played center. I'm going against Bill Moss and Dan Saliamo in minicamp, and I've got to snap the ball to Steve DeBerg, who took one snap for me in practice. So, uh, yeah, that's the story of my draft and coming to Kansas City. So to answer your question, I called Carl, and I said, hey, Carl, I'm writing a book. Uh, you know, I appreciate you drafting me. You know me as good as anybody. Would you like to forward this? And he was nice enough. But knowing Carl, like you do, JP, yeah. he wanted to read the book first because yeah. he wanted to make sure that – I wasn't saying anything about anybody that he disagreed with. Yeah, uh, so including was, him. 
Yeah. <laughs> I told a couple of stories about him too. I, there was one that he's like, you know, I don't remember when I came out with two different shoes when I yelled. He at did. Him. Yeah. And and he did. And that was after Derek's. You know, you guys, you you know, you yeah. know very well. The Monday night meltdown on Denver, the Denver yeah. game, and and you know that's the first time that Lamar Hunt ever yelled at anybody. Yeah, came into that locker room, and then at practice, Carl came out. And Carl was so mad; his hair is all disheveled. If you know Carl, he yeah. always looked like the nines, and he had two different shoes on. So Zada and I looked at each other and laughed, and we probably should have gotten in trouble for laughing at Carl while he was yelling at us, but. Uh, <laughs> He had two different shoes on. So it was the only thing he said. Oh, I don't quite remember having two different shoes on. I said, yeah, he did, Carl. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Uh, Carl yeah. had his own um, way of doing things. You know, it's funny you say that because J.J. had a similar story. You know, when he was brought in to Kansas City, you know, Marty told him, I'll be giving you a call, you know, after his workout. And he hadn't heard from him for about three weeks. And J.J. went to the facility and he said, look, you know, I, I'm broke. <laughs> he said, uh, I got no money. I, I, I've got, you know, bills I got to pay. I got to buy diapers. I've got things I've got to do. And Marty said, I really apologize. I'm sorry. I haven't called you, but he stood up and he took 250 bucks out of his pocket. That was on a Friday. And he said, here, well, this gets you through the weekend. I'll call you on Monday. And JJ reluctantly took it, but he did because he needed the money. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Marty called him on Monday. You know, I mean, he, I loved Marty. I mean, yeah. I did. I really, he was just a great guy all the way around. And it was, he, he, I always tell people when I was at practice or watching everybody play, it was like when you heard him talking, you just kind of gravitated. You could gravitate. It, it was like you just floated across the field to listen to what he had to say. He just was a philosophical guy that had everything in the world to say. And, and when he said it, it meant something. Sometimes you didn't understand it, but it meant something. Yeah, it's funny uh, you say that because, you know, Marty was an English te- English teacher by trade. That's what yeah. he wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, so he had a master um, uh, um, usage of the English language. He was really good, really smart, very articulate. Yes. Um, you know, and I have a, a, a pretty similar story. In about third or fourth game of my career, when I – my father had cancer, uh, probably started maybe junior year or senior year uh, at Notre Dame, and – and he was heading downhill. And I got a call from my mom one time. He was down in Mountain Home, Arkansas, where they were retired down to. And and uh, she said, you better, you know, come on down. I don't think your dad's going to make it. And this was on a Monday night around 4 or 5. We just got off the field and got out of practice. And I zipped back over to Arrowhead. And I said, Marty, I said, you know, my dad's not doing very well. And my mom really wants me to get down to Mountain Home. He said, hold on. Let me see if I could find a private jet to get you down there. Yeah. And it was 5 or 6 o'clock, maybe 7 o'clock at night on a Monday he had a hard time. He just couldn't pull it off. He said, listen, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to give me a call when you get to Springfield, Missouri. And, and this is before car phones and cell phones. So I had to get out in Springfield. I'll never forget. I was right by the Bass Pro Shops over there off of Sunshine yeah. or Sunset Drive, whatever it was. And I got off and, and I used a pay phone. I died. And I called him Collect. And it was yeah. a collect call from Tim Grunhart to Marty Schottenheimer. And he answered and he said, okay, you know, thanks for calling me. And when you get to your house, call me again. And he was just so concerned. And when I got yeah. to my house in Arkansas, he will talk to my mom, talk to my brother, talk to, you know, me, obviously. But he was one of those guys that just, you know, you always felt that at that point, I said, you know what, I'd do anything for this guy. Yeah. And I tried to, the rest of my career, lead his team and give him an opportunity to win with intensity, enthusiasm, and, and trying to be the leader on the field. And it really all stems back from him you know, really caring when I was at my lowest point. And that's the, you know, and it's funny because you were a leader and and Marty, he just, I don't know, he had so much admiration and respect for everybody. And and I think that, you know, in turn gained him all the respect and admiration from everybody. I, you know, when I met him, I didn't know, cause I, you know, I'd heard stories about him and things and I always heard he was a great guy, but he was very intense. Um, and I didn't know how to, you know, how I was going to, I guess how he was going to react to me. And he was just, I was just one of the guys and I didn't even play for the chiefs. I mean, I was just some guy that, you know, knew everybody. And it was, it was so great to have him there. Uh, and just to listen to things he had to say, he was, he was a great guy, but he, you know, it's sad that he's gone, but, um, he, he taught me a lot. He really did. And I'm going to ask you something because it's, it's something that I remember distinctly. Um, 
when Christian Okoye walked onto the field for the first time, the practice field, I was sitting next to Derek and I said, who the hell is that? Hmm. And he goes, that's Christian. I said, yeah, right. And he goes, no, it really is. I said, that's Christian Okoye. And he goes, yeah. I said, that's the guy that ran what, four, five, seven or whatever it was. And he goes, yeah. And I said, that's impossible. And he goes, you'll see. And he started sprinting and he ran across, he, he ran down the field and I thought, Jesus, he is so fast for somebody at 253 pounds, you know, just a monster. He was built like Adonis, you know, I mean, the guy was just a unbelievable specimen of a person. And I said, uh, I don't even know how that's possible. And he goes, nobody knows. He goes, that's why he's here. But he couldn't, you know, he couldn't take the snap. Um, he had a really rough time with that. And he just hated football. I mean, he told me he hated football at the time. Hmm. And he would get very frustrated. But there was a specific time that he got the snap. And Marty, and Marty I remember Marty saying this to him. He said, look, he's because he was getting very frustrated. And Marty said, look, he said, when you get the ball, tuck it and run over who's ever in front of you. Doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> so Christian, you know, of course, okay, coach. And he got it on about the sixth try. And JJ was out running protection. And he laid JJ out, knocked him out. He was so upset. I mean, he was actually crying. <laughs> and I thought he was dead. I jumped off a bench and I ran over there and I thought for sure. He was just laying flat out like you see in a movie where his arms are spread out one way, his legs are another, his <laughs> eyes are wide open. And I thought, Jesus Christ, he's dead. And then they gave him smelling stalts and he woke up, you know, and he says, uh, what the hell happened? And Christian said, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't coach just told me to run over who was ever in front of me. I didn't mean to do it. And he said, I understand. And JJ was so nice. You know, he said, I understand, but we're on the same team. He <laughs> said, he, you know, he meant, you know, after, you know, when we're playing against <laughs> someone else. And of course, needless to say, JJ, JJ didn't practice the rest of the game. And Christian really didn't either. He was so damn distraught that he didn't want to practice it that day. And I talked to JJ a little while afterwards and I said, are you okay? And he goes, I'm still wrong. And I hmm. said, really? And he goes, good God, he hits hard. And I said, you're little and you took a massive hit. He goes, yeah, I don't know how I even lived through that. Hmm. Well, fast forward, you know, through JJ's career and we had talked, you know, we talk all the time and he says, well, he was on our show and he says, you know, in the nine years that I played in the NFL, the hardest hit I ever took was from Christian Okoye in practice. And to this day, he says that. And I'm like, I, I, I don't, I don't know if you remember that day. I'll never forget it. And Christian was so angry at himself. And he kept saying, I hate this damn game because he wasn't a violent guy. You know I mean? He wasn't one of those guys that wanted to purposely hurt someone, I guess I should say. But, uh, he, I just told him, I said, Christian, you know what? You're going to be great. I said, you just got to just focus and maintain and don't, don't worry about that. Move forward from that. And Marty was listening to me and we had we only had like a 10 minute conversation about it. And I said, you know, you may hate the game now, but you're going to love it later. And Marty walked up to me and he goes, where did you, what, where'd you get that from? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, that little speech you gave Christian. And I said, I got it from you. He goes, what? And I said, I got it from you. And he said, what do you mean you got it from me? I said, I listen to everything you say as much as you don't think. I, I know I don't play for this team, but I listen to everything you say. And you you motivate people to a point where I would want to run through a brick wall for you. Yeah. And I, I felt bad for the guy. And he goes, wow. And after that, Marty was so nice to me. <laughs> I mean, he was just one of the nicest guys to me ever. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was a great, it was a great thing, but um, anyway, you had a hell of a career. Um, I remember things that a lot of people won't because I'm old, but, um, you know, you, you played a long time when you have 10 years, 169 games. I think you had eight fumbles. Um, you really made an impact on the team as a whole. And a lot of people can't say that they did that. Um, as you know, I know. Offense and defense didn't get along that well on the same team back in that day. I mean, there was fights, there was helmets thrown, there was all kinds of things going on. And I asked Derek one time, I said, why the hell do you guys hate each other so much? He goes, we're a different team on the field than we are, you know, in practice than we are in a game. And I said, oh, well, I'll go along with that story. And I left it at that. I never understood it. You know, I mean, I played baseball, so it was a different, 
realm for me. And uh, anyway, you, you did have a huge impact on a lot of players. I mean, a lot of guys still to this day talk about the impact that you had on them as a player. And you, I guess you motivated a lot of people to play harder, play stronger. Um, you were an intense individual. I don't think people realize how intense you were when you played the game. Um, it was scary. And again, I was on the sidelines. So I didn't, when you scare somebody that's on the sidelines and you make, damn, I hope I never get hit by that guy. Or I hope he never gets pissed off at me. <laughs> that's, sure. that's when you know there's something uh, right about, you know, they're doing something right. And yeah. you did it right. I mean, you played a long time and you, you, I mean, you were all rookie. You were on the all rookie team. You did all of these things that, you know, a lot back in the day, and I know you know this, offensive linemen weren't regarded as, you know, the top, the cream of the crop when it came to football. It was like, okay, well, he's a lineman. And I remember somebody quoting one time, well, left guard, you know, when, you know, just talking about offensive linemen, left guards really don't matter. And I thought, hmm. what do you mean they don't matter? I mean, where do these people come up with this stuff? But you playing center and coming from the position that you came from, you translated very quickly which a lot of guys don't do. I mean, we see it now as much as ever, especially with like Orlando Brown switching from right to left. It's been a transition for him. Sure. How are you able to do it so quickly and able, I mean, you, I, I watched you take on two guys and they never got near the quarterback for the most part. Well, I don't know how you, know, you did that. What, one of the, one of the things that, that we, always try to do first of all the, the great thing about playing the offensive line position and you're exactly right i mean you're kind of overlooked it doesn't matter whether it was 30 years ago even today i mean some of these guys are starting to get paid a little bit better but so is everybody else yeah. you know we always talk about the offensive line like being a hand right you have the five guys on the offensive line but in order for you to have success in order for you to be strong in order for you to get your job done you got to make a fist all five guys got to work as one and you got to have somebody in the middle or you got to have somebody who's going to be the leader and the communicator and you got to be somebody who's you know going to try to get people in the best position the one big the biggest compliment i would get from guys that i played with he said hey listen you make us better yeah. because you're always communicating and you you know what's going on you're like a coach on the field so that was something I really took a lot of pride in. There's three things that I learned from Mike Webster. Mike Webster was my mentor. Number one is finish every play and run to the line of scrimmage. I mean, that was all part of it. Hey, show effort, run to the line of scrimmage, and, you know, finish plays to the whistle. You know, be the one that goes down there and the first one to celebrate with somebody for uh, scores a touchdown. Be the guy that runs up and helps the running back up. Be there for the wide receiver in case somebody's trying to peel or take a cheap shot on you're going to be there. Number two – was be the smartest guy on the field at the, at the at the at the center position. It's like being a traffic cop. You know, you got to get guys in the right position, and you got to get guys to understand where they're going to go and how they're going to get there. And if they don't do that, if they don't do it correctly, that's on you as the center. And you know, you, all five guys got to work as one, and you got to be on the same page. And in order for that to happen, you got to communicate. And then the last thing, uh, like you've said many many times, is you got to just have a lot of love for the game. And that's what he said. You know what? We are so blessed and so lucky to play this football, this game called football. And he said, when we're out there, you know, it, it, it ends for everybody. His famous line would be, it ends for everybody, some sooner than others. Yep. It ends for everybody. So finish every play, play to the whistle, be the smartest guy in the field, and enjoy every snap. And if you live in that world, uh, which I tried to do for the 11 years that I played, if you live in that world, if you do those little things, then people will follow you. Yeah, I was a boisterous guy. Yeah, I had a big personality. Yeah, I would always be talking and always be communicating, always doing things. Uh, but I also tried to lead by example and tried to lead by uh, being the guy that was the last one to leave the weight room or the last one to leave the film room or the last one to leave the field and work on different things and be the first one there uh, at practice and do all those little things that you do. The younger guys will look up to you. And I'll never forget Brian Waters, who was a, just a young offensive lineman coming into Kansas City. And he said to me, hey, can you give me one piece of advice? Just one thing uh, that I could take from you to give myself the best opportunity to have success. And I said, you got to know more than the guy next to you. You got to know what you're doing. You try to know more than the coach. Try to know more than everybody else. Because if you know more, believe me, they're going to put you on the field if you are ready and prepared 
because those are the guys they want out there because they don't want mental errors. They don't want misassignments. They don't want bad mistakes. So be the smartest guy in the field. Yeah, you can be big. You can be physical. You can be fast. You can be tough, all those things. But if you know what the hell you're doing, you're no use to anybody. So be the yeah. smartest guy in the field. Well, you had an impact on him because he was great. I mean, he was a great player through his yep. career. So you definitely uh, gave him the right advice. That's for sure. You know, it, when you say that, I tell people all the time, especially a lot of fans that don't understand football IQ. And there's, you know, there's a lot of different styles of IQ. There's a lot of different things you can be extremely intelligent in. But with football IQ, it's different. Um, you have to be able to. I guess, motivate everyone else to play, make other players better, which you were able to do. There's very few guys that care enough, I guess I should say, to make others better. You know, it's always that, you know, there's always a guy waiting, you know, to take your spot. Um, and you've always heard that phrase, you know, Marty even said it, it's a day-to-day -day game. You know, it's a week-to-week -week game. One week you may be here, one week you may not. So enjoy it. And guys don't understand that it's, the football IQ part of this is so detrimental to the game or instrumental to the game. Instrumental, sure. It, because it's, you know, you look at guys like I, I always talk about Derek because Derek, you know, you know him, you know how he was. He didn't like to work out a lot. Everybody, you know, a lot of people assumed he was lazy. It wasn't the fact that he was lazy. It was just that he, in fact, his words to me were, you know, I tried that because I asked him one day at his house, I said, you know, wouldn't, why don't you work out a lot? And he says, what, do you think I need to? And I said, no, I'm not saying that. I said, but wouldn't you think it would make you, you know, a little better? You're already great. He said, well, you know, I tried that at Alabama. I worked out four or five days a week. I did all this stuff. And I, you know, he said, what I found out was, is on Saturday I was stiff and I, I wasn't able to play as well. And he said, the one thing that I could tell anyone if it helps them is that you don't have to be the strongest in my position, you just have to be the quickest off the ball and have the best technique. And, you, and if you can read an offense, then you're going to be successful. And that's the one thing that Derek was very good at. Yeah. You were the same way on the opposite end. You were able to read defenses and able to know what their plan, it seemed to me anyway, what their plan was prior to the snap even happening. That's something that's not – that's a gift, and it's a lot of hard work to be able to understand that. And you put a lot of time in to grasp that, where a lot of guys don't do that. They just think it's, you know, let me go out there, let me run my assignment. If I hit my assignment, great. If I don't, you know, it's not my fault. And you never had that mentality. Um, you were like – you were intense, and you were the loudest guy on the field. There was no doubt. I mean, you people heard you when you talked. I heard you when you talked. Yeah, and it's yeah. hard to do it, Arrowhead. Yeah. And, so. the, and the cra the crazy thing is that I was just so blessed. Like I talked about Howard Mudd being my first offensive line coach for the first four years. And Howard was a very very smart uh, uh, coach as far as scheme and everything else. But he was more known for his technique and fundamental work. Mm -hmm. So as a young guy, you need those little things like that to do well. And then my next coach that came in was Alex Gibbs. And Alex Gibbs, I mean, listen, this guy. My uh, offensive line coaches at, at Kansas City could be on the Mount Rushmore of offensive line coaches. They really could. Yeah. Uh, Howard Mudd was about as good as anybody at technique and fundamentals. Alex Gibbs was probably the best scheme coach he'd ever coached in the NFL in the offensive line. And he taught me how to watch film. And he taught me how to read tendencies. And he taught me how to read defenses. He taught me, hey, listen, if the safety is topped off over here and the backers have his feet this way, then, you know, hey, go ahead and change the protection and get out there and and let's put ourselves in the best position to have success. So he taught me how to read uh, defenses. He taught me how to read schemes. He taught me how to be a better player of being the, like I said, the traffic cop out there. And then after that, I had Art Shell. Art Shell, I mean, yeah. here's a guy that it was a Hall of Fame player and a Hall of Fame, uh, I contend, a Hall of Fame coach. Uh, but he was different because he was more of a player's coach. He knew how to play. He played the game. And I learned a lot from him about how to handle myself and how to go about my business, both on and off the field as a professional football player. And then Mike Solari, who was in the league for many, many years and was still uh, in the league last year up in Seattle. And he he's had a long, uh, illustrious career. So, you know, you're blessed when you have coaches like that. And, you know, you try to take it. I tell everybody. 
Uh, now I coach offensive line and a run game coordinator in high school, and I'm having a great time with that and doing that and having having a lot of fun working with kids. But I always tell coaches or I tell players everything. Is, Listen, if you can get take one thing from a clinic or one thing from a practice or one thing from a game and you can learn from that, then you're getting better. And I think too many times – People are trying to do too many things at one time instead of focusing in on maybe one or two things to get better at each week. And then you build on that, you build on that. And the next thing you know, you've, you've done the job that you need to do to be a better football player. And, and I think too many times, you know, people are trying to listen to all this information. And believe me, everybody's got an opinion. Oh yeah. Everybody's going to share it. Uh, so uh uh, that was important to me is to just take one little thing from each one of those coaches and put it into my repertoire. And I would tell all the time and I tell our kids, listen, put it in the toolbox, because when you get out there in a the game, eventually you're going to have to take that tool out. And you're going to have to take that little technique or they're going to take that knowledge out of the toolbox and go ahead and use it in the game. And that's how you become a better football player. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's 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 definitely a technique in a in a. An edu- I guess I should say an educational tool, um, a game that you need to have the smarts to be able to go out and learn from your mistakes. Uh, guys seem to, some guys, I mean, you didn't see it so much back then as you do now, I guess, but, uh, I, and it could be just simply because, you know, people are getting paid. They're younger. I don't, I don't know. Their mindset's different. I really don't know what it is. And in, in, in this new world, like we were talking prior to the show, you know, with all the technology and all the things, you know, everybody's trying to build a brand and they want to have, you know, guys are making money off playing video games on Twitch. I mean, I, n- never in a million years, you and I would have ever thought that we could sit down with a Nintendo when we were kids and make money off of it. But now guys are making millions of dollars and because they're using their platform to do that, but they're spending, it seems like to me, some of these guys that aren't really getting into that, that realm of where they should be because they're physically talented. They're, they're obviously intelligent, but yet their mindset is I want to play video games and make money <laughs> off of that. Yeah. And I, that is still, I mean, and, and look, it's probably because I'm, you know, I'm older and I just don't understand it, but you know, when I played baseball, it took me a while. I'm left-handed, of course, and a left-handed guy that, you know, threw 96, 97 miles an hour at a very young age, and I didn't have a lot of control. Um, I had a very good mentor that helped me with that, and he got me under control, and I learned from him every day. All the way, I mean, from a little kid all the way up, he taught me certain fundamentals and certain things that I can do, certain ways of a you know, hold the ball, flick my wrist, just different things to have a mean curveball or crazy slider, you know, and you don't have too many left-handed guys that threw overhand and which was was kind of an anomaly. And the fact that I had six, seven pitches and that was different. So I, but I learned from those guys that taught me similar to, you know, I wish, you know, if I'd had a little bit more, um, I don't know how to say this, but I guess maybe uh, brains at the time when I got injured, I got injured in a scouting event and it was just a weird situation, but uh, I wasn't thinking clearly when it happened and I just wanted to impress everybody was there is really my whole goal behind it. And, you know, you got to throw 80 pitches and that's, I got to 78 and that was kind of the end of my career, but uh, it, it, it all goes, you know, I look at like you and I look at, you know, Dan and all those guys that played back in the, you know, the the trench guys that played hard every day, day in and day out. And they lasted for so long in the league. A lot of that is simply because you knew what to do, when to do it, how to do it and how to keep yourself healthy. And a lot of guys don't look at it, the game that way. I mean, you remember the old, like the old tight ends, they didn't care about catching the football. They cared about hitting somebody. That was what they wanted to do. Yeah. You're, you're not going to last too long in the league by, you know, going that direction. I mean, we've got, we're seeing it now with George Kittle. I mean, the guy has been in the league for, I don't know, he's 29 years old and he seems like he's injured every year because his goal is to go out and hit somebody as hard as he can absolutely hit them. Um, he's really not built for that. And, you're, and he definitely is not a good plan if you want to have longevity in this league. Yeah. But um, he, uh, he does it and he still does it to this day. He still just lamb blasts people. You'd think he'd quit by now, but, 
just hasn't happened. But regardless, you did a lot for the team and you did a lot for everybody. Actually, it's, it's crazy. And you're at Bishop Miege. I mean, you've been like all over the place. You were head coach there. Then you went to Kansas. Right. Then you came back to Bishop, Bishop Miege. You've done sports talk. I remember that because I did some back in the day. Yeah. And you're doing it now a little bit still, right? You're Are you on 810? Is that correct? Yeah, so I'm on eight ten. Uh, I do uh, uh, three hours a week, and then I do some uh, pregame on Sundays. Yeah. Uh, I basically go on every show that uh, is on during the day. Uh, I don't have my own show anymore. A, I don't want to put that much more that much time into it, and B, uh, with coaching and all the other stuff I have going on, uh, it was just too much. So I enjoy going over, and I do the morning show with the, the Border Patrol, and then I do a uh, show with Seren Petro. I'm sure you probably. Yeah. Ran. And then Frank Bull and I do a show on Thursday nights called Crunch Time. Uh, so we, we stay, I stay pretty, pretty active. But uh, yeah, my, my first love is, uh, you know, and people always say to me, well, you know, yeah, you coach college. How come you didn't stay in there? I said, you know, I just I gave it a shot. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, it just it just um, to me, um, I, I thought you could make more of a difference coaching high school kids. And, you know, so you know, one of the things that, that I hear all the time is, hey, how come you haven't gone and done some like color for, you know, college games or decided to go in and maybe do some, you know, some uh, uh, TV work for the NFL? And it really all comes back to um, Mike Webster once again, is Mike Webster gave me an opportunity with a mentorship to make a living and be the best football player I possibly can. And I always felt so bad that I didn't understand and know where Mike was mentally. Uh, you know, he had a lot of issues. He disappeared. He came back. He disappeared yeah. again. And, uh, you know, I always felt like, gosh, if I would have known, if I would have been around, if I, maybe if I would have paid more attention, I could have maybe helped Mike out or, you know, yeah. got some help or did something. And I wasn't able to do that. So I've decided, hey, to honor him and to, and to, to uh, kind of live up to the legacy that he had here with me is that I would give kids, high school kids, an opportunity to use football as a vehicle. You know, there's a football program out there for everybody. They're not all power five. You got division two, you got division three. And I think it's just so important to play football because to me, football is a microcosm of life. We all have fourth down situations in life we got to convert. And you know what? You can't back down from a challenge. You can't back down from a tough situation. You learn those situations. You learn those things in football. And uh, so if you can get a young kid and give him an opportunity to go to college, or give him an opportunity to have some discipline, or give him an opportunity to have a time management plan in his brain when he goes to college, whether he plays sports or not, um, you know, I think that that to me is the most important thing. So that's what I've decided to do in my life is try to pay it back, try to pay it uh, to some of these kids and give them an opportunity that Mike gave me. And, and it's been great for me, you know, I've coached my two sons who played over at Bishop Miege, had a great time with them, won some state championships, it's all fine and dandy. But more importantly than that, to put out a lot of kids that have been in the community and have been uh, great members of the Kansas City uh, community and have uh, gone on and done great things. And to me, that's just so important. And that's my I'm kind of giving back to Mike for that. Well, I think that's extremely admirable because, you know, when I was in high school, we had a football coach. It was he played for Nebraska. Was injured. Um, end up being a high school coach. He was a, a really. I played football with him. You know, I, I played through high school. I didn't, and a little bit in college. But my forte was baseball. So uh, he was just such a great mentor to have. And it, there's nothing better. I think if you can start them at a younger age, and somebody like you that has been through the whole trials and tribulations of going from high school to college, getting into the NFL, playing 10 years, that gives somebody motivation to not only, whether it be football or sports or whatever the case it is, it builds that discipline that they're going to need in life. And it gives them hope that regardless of what they do, if they fail, they can, you know, if, if you fall down, you get back up, you fall down, you're going to get back up. And that's something I think is awesome that you're doing because a lot of guys don't do that. I, th I know Christian did that for a while as well. And I don't know if he still is or not, um, but he was teaching high school football for a while. And I just think it's a, it's just great that you guys are doing. I mean, anybody can go to college and, and, and do it, you know, that, but when you, when you're doing it from a younger age and you're really giving these guys what they need to know when they do get to college, 
that's something that a lot of kids don't have. A lot of kids don't yeah. get. And, and so you know that's, that's awesome. And you know what, JP, it, it's it's so, and, and I know you've been around this uh, in whether you're, you know, in Nevada or Kansas City or wherever. There's just so many parents out there that are just so focused in on themselves. Yeah. Oh God. And yeah. that, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, they care about their kids, but a lot of times they're just not giving them the kind of attention and the kind of discipline and the kind of focus that they need to have uh, in order to be successful. And it's such a shame. And maybe just maybe you have an effect on a kid and give him a little bit of discipline. And you know what? Give him a little bit of love when he does something good. Kick him in the ass when he does something bad. Exactly. But, yeah. but, but make sure that he understands that, you know, hey, listen, I'm criticizing the performance. I love the performer. Yeah, I'm criticizing the performance. You know, if you don't do something right, then you're going to hear about it. Yeah. But you know, if you do something right, but understand either way that you know I'm giving you attention because I love you, I care for you, I want you to be the best possible person you can be. And I think too many times in this age, not all of them, but parents, a lot of times, I mean, they're just too busy for their kids. They got so many yeah. other things going on. They're so worried about themselves that they forget about that these kids need that kind of attention. And, you know, my father was a Chicago policeman, a violent crime detective. Yeah. He worked midnights. And gosh, you know, he worked from 11 o'clock at night until about 8 o'clock in the morning. He would come home. He'd sleep during the day. We were at school. But, you know, he coached all our baseball teams, our basketball teams. He went out and helped out with different things, you know, with the football team. You know, so he was out there, you know, between 3 o'clock and, you know, through dinner. And then you know, we'd have dinner together every night. That was one of the things we sat down as a family and had dinner. That was important to him. And then he went to bed and took a couple more hours, a little nap, and he went to work. That was his day. But yeah. the only time that he had available, he gave to his kids. And I think, too, and that was that was important to us. And we knew that as kids. You know, my brother played professional baseball. He went up all yeah. the way to AAA, played for the California Angels and Oakland A's. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he had a good effect on, on my brother. It had a good effect on me. And if you, if you let kids know that you care for them, that you love them, and you really want them to have success – and it's just amazing what they can do. So, um, yeah, I think it's just so important nowadays if you have a little bit of time uh, to, you know, give back to kids and give them an opportunity to use sports as a vehicle to yeah. maybe change their lives. And uh, it's just so important. It is. It's, you know, and I ask people all the time because, you know, I'm, I'm fairly blunt and um, I'll say what I, is on my mind. And it, it, there's times that I've asked people, why the hell do you why did you ever have kids? And they look at me like, what do you mean? Well, you you work, you come home, you ignore them, yeah. you yell at them. They can't do anything right. They can't do anything wrong. No matter what they do is wrong. What the hell is the purpose of having kids? Unless, I mean, are, did you do it for a tax write-off or did you do it because you actually wanted kids? You know, and people get pissed at me because I say things like that. But look, I mean, you know, I, I went through that little phase of, you know, needing, I guess I, a mindset of, you know, I, I got to make as much money as I can make. I've got to, you know, I, I've got to push myself to a point where I, I don't know my kids, you know, and yeah. I've got three. Um, my youngest is turning 13 this week. And I've been lucky enough that I learned from that mistake. And um, I'm spending more time with my kids, you know, with my daughters. I could, my other ones are grown and gone, but um, they actually live in Kansas City, but uh, it's just uh, it's something that you have to really put the effort in if you want your kids to succeed. And if you don't, your kids, unless they have somebody like you that's going to go out and help them, which I, you know, as much as this may not sound great, it may not. There's no really uh, there's no replacement for a parent. Sure. And if you're going to put the effort in like you do to help these kids succeed when their parents, of course, I mean, if you look at it over the years, I mean, it's just gotten worse, but probably 60, 70% of the parents out there don't really put a lot of effort into what their kids are doing in life. Yeah. Um, and that's sad. I mean, part of the TJP is that, listen, they all want to be friends with their kids. I don't, yeah. want, my, I don't want my kids to be my friends. I've had no. four, I have four kids. I love my kids to death. They're my heart. They're my soul. They're they're what I'm about. But I've told them many times. I said, "Listen, I'm not your friend. You got plenty of friends. I'm not your friend. I don't want to be your friend. I'm your yeah, father." Exactly. You know, and 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 uh, you know, uh, we'll have that relationship. Now I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to do whatever. And I, you know, I love you. 
but uh, you know, it, it, we have that, that fine line of respect where you know they they've got to understand that there's the difference between right and wrong, and you're going to be held accountable to that. And you know, so and I know we're probably going on a tangent. Everybody here is like probably, oh, yeah, yeah. Peace, but, <laughs> but, the, but the reality of the situation is that uh, you know it, it really has a lot to do with the the structure. If you look at the Kansas City Chiefs today. Yeah. Andy Reid as the head of this team. Andy Reid does such a great job, oh, I man. think, of teaching these guys that they have to be prepared. Uh, I call it the mental, physical aspect of football. Uh, they're tested mentally and they're tested physically. And one of the things that Andy Reid does really well, and he still does it during the football season, he's one of the only coaches that does this, that he challenges these guys physically. And then after he gets a little tired, a little bit worn out, then he throws a mental part at them and he sees how they react. And those are the guys that play. Those are the guys that he, you see on the field playing on Sundays are the guys that can handle that when you're tired and you're worn out. Because, listen, not only is it a long game, but it's a hell of a long season. Yes. And you're going to hit – if you're a rookie, you're going to hit a rookie wall. That's part of it. If you're a veteran guy, you're going to get tired. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get sore. You're never at 100%. But you're like, – like Lou Holtz, you say all the time – Man, your mind controls your body. What your <laughs> mind tells you, your body will do. And yeah. he does a really good job, Andy, of making sure these guys are mentally prepared for a football game. And I think that's a lot with parenting and a lot with coaching. You know, you got the the mental aspect of, of, of challenging somebody and letting them know that you care about them, letting them know that you're there for them, uh, is so much more important than how big and how fast and how strong they are. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, but I, that was actually my next segue is what, you know, looking at the time that you played and looking at it now, what do you think the changes have been? What do you see as far as how things have evolved in the game and looking at the Kansas City Chiefs now? I mean, you mentioned it in your book a lot, The you know, the, it, basically the evolution of Kansas City. Yeah. Um, what is, you know, you look at like a Patrick Mahomes and an Andy Reid, um, even an Alex Smith for that matter. He, they changed the culture of the city. Um, I think Marty changed the culture in the day. Uh, we had, I mean, you, you know how, well, you probably don't, if you weren't a Kansas City fan prior to 1990 um, and didn't pay much attention to how bad they actually were, um, yeah. not just from a coaching standpoint, but from a GM standpoint, a player standpoint, a scouting standpoint, they were just rough. Um, and now you look at it from, I, I remember when they brought everybody in, in the 90 class, the 91 class, every class after that. And I kept thinking all Marty is doing is just building and building and building and getting better. The only thing that I noticed was, is that sometimes Carl would bring in guys that were really kind of close to the end of their career. You know, like I'm not dis, uh, diminishing anything that Joe Montana ever did, but he was really close to the end of his career. And he did his best for us in 93. Mm -hmm. And I cried like a baby when we lost that game in Buffalo. I was actually there. And it was a rough, rough day. Um, but looking at how Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, and even Brett Veach for that matter, they have changed this culture and changed the way not only a GM looks at a player, whether because Veach is no lazy individual. I tell these people all the time, he's not the guy sitting back in an office waiting for a, a scouting group to bring in players. He goes yeah. out and finds his players because that's what his job was. And I look at Andy and I think, God, I mean, this guy has been around for so long, been through so much, but yet he has changed. He, he evolves with the times. And I, a lot of coaches don't do that, especially when they get up there in age, they don't evolve with the times. What do you see when you look at this team now versus – you know, the past 20 years, just put it that way. Well, first of all, you got to start with, with Andy Reid. Andy Reid, I think, is one of the best coaches of making adjustments during a game that, that I've ever seen. I mean, uh, some of the things that he does and some of the things that he's able to do uh, during the game is special. You know, anybody can have a game plan, but, uh, you know, once that game plan goes awry, if they make adjustments to that, you know, it's, it's like a chess game. You know, can you make that next move and give yourself an opportunity uh, so he's really good at that. The other thing is, listen, the NFL has become a quarterback-driven league. 
Uh, it's always been important to have a great quarterback. And, you know, we've had some good quarterbacks, never had that great quarterback. Joe Montana, obviously, was one of the best quarterbacks ever. But you're exactly right. He was older and he was towards the end of his career. Uh, you know, Rich Gannon was good. And, you know, Gerback yeah. had a little bit of time. And, you know, you can go through the list. But it's a quarterback-driven league. A guy like Patrick Mahomes is special. And um, when you have guys like that that, that not only um, can create – and make plays uh, uh, when things aren't there, but also be able to demand excellence from everybody around them, from the offense to the defensive side. Your your point exactly is right. Even to this day, offenses and defenses are two different camps. I'm not going to call it like, and I'm not talking politics here, but I'm not going to say it's like Democrats or Republicans, but it's pretty damn close. They may be <laughs> Right. You're right. But, you know, there's times when, you know, we'd have a meeting and all the defensive guys would stand up and clap uh, because they were happy about what was being said. And then they say something else. The offensive guys would stand up and clap because they were happy, just like in Congress when you watch it, you know, <laughs> everybody stands up when it's a partisan deal. Well, yeah. defenses and offenses are very similar. But when you have a leader and that's what we've struggled with in our in our country now is is having a leader that can connect and bring everybody together and Patrick Mahomes is that kind of guy he can bring everybody together and yes. he's the leader of that team and everybody respects him and that is just so important to point out uh, that when you have a guy that's not only your best player but also the leader and everybody respects him then you got something going on so Andy Reid great coach unbelievable adjustments but Patrick Mahomes is a special special guy there's no, I honestly, God, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone that can do the things he does. He's five steps ahead of everybody. And when I, I, when I say that to people, they don't really understand what I'm saying, but he has five plays in his mind that he will work out prior to the snap. And he, he's a very elusive guy, which is pretty amazing to me that he's, he, he his eye movements is hand gestures the way he when he's rolling out of the pocket i watch all 22 and i look at the things he does to throw off a defensive player or two or three or five and they don't know where he's going to go from one second to the next they don't know if he's going to throw the ball if he's going to run the ball if he's going to if it's just a little flea flicker he they have no clue what the hell he's going to do not to mention the fact that he's crazy accurate and and every aspect of – and every position that he's in. I mean, the guy is horizontal, vertical. It doesn't matter. He's he's just unbelievably talented. I know a lot of that comes from his dad. I played against his dad in the minors, and Jesus, he was good. Um, he was a great pitcher. Um, but he just has a great family too, a great family upbringing. But he's just so damn intense, and he's – very intelligent. I don't, it's, it's very hard to articu articulate how extremely intelligent he is to have somebody on the field. You know, you could talk about all the other quarterbacks in the league and look, if he played for the Raiders, as much as I don't like the Raiders, um, I would say the same thing yeah. because he's just such a talented quarterback. It's like, you can give him the reins and say, here, go and do what you've got to do to win this football game. And he will figure out a way of doing it. He's just that good. I've never seen anybody play and throw a football the way he throws a football. I mean, anybody can throw a slider with a football. There's something wrong. There, I mean, I don't know how you can do that. Hmm. His ball curves. Yeah. I mean, the guy yeah. can throw a curveball with a football. That's – I mean, you've been around the game a lot longer I and a lot, around a lot more people. Have you ever seen anybody throw a football like him? No. You know, the crazy thing is, too, and, and to your point – uh, talking about, you know, he's four or five steps ahead of everybody else. I want everybody to watch uh, here on Chiefs Focus podcast when you're watching this. Next game that the Kansas City Chiefs play, I want you to watch Patrick Mahomes between plays. His mind is racing. He's yes. really thinking two or three, and he does this all the time. He wants those plays in quickly so that he can get things going. So I want you to watch his hand. He's always trying to, hey, get, let's get this play. Let's get it going. Let's get it going. Let's get it going. Yeah. And, I mean, that is just so unique that his mind – is already two or three or four steps ahead of what's going on. He, he he understands what he's looking for. He understands how he wants to do it. 
and he's just waiting for that play to come in so that he can put all those scenarios and put that puzzle together and give his team an opportunity to win. Yeah, yeah. he's a special cat. And really, there's a lot of good football players on this team. And listen, in, in the book, uh, you know, View from the Center, Tim Grunhart, uh, if you want to buy the book, it's at timgrunhart.com. If you buy it there, I'll give you an autographed copy. of Once again, timgrunhart.com. Yes. I talk about the quarterbacks that I was around. And I was around guys like Rich Gannon. And Rich Gannon in the huddle, he, he, demanded, uh, he demanded to be the, the guy, the leader of that huddle. And if you were talking, so he, you got to have a quarterback to say, hey, listen, shut up. I'm the yeah. guy in the huddle. And, you know, there would be times when we'd be bitching and moaning, hey, we should be running the ball more. And he's like, listen, do you guys want to call these plays? Do you want to hand the ball off? Do you guys want to take those hits? Go ahead. Do it. If you don't want to do that, then shut up and keep me safe and give me an opportunity. <laughs> and it was great. And yeah. That's just the way it was. So, yeah, quarterbacks are a special breed, and we got a really good one in Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, we really do. And, then, and you know, you in your book, you talk, you, you talk about all the quarterbacks that you've been around and also – Andy Reid and and going back to 1990 and forward, but mm -hmm. you really put an emphasis on how um, intelligent he is and what a special breed he is. He's a generational talent. I don't know if anybody will ever deny that. I mean, people, of course, are going to be upset that he's as good as he is if you're a different fan base. Of, you know, I mean, we've heard everything, Tim. Honest to God, how many times have you read – whether it be on Twitter or in an article, well, it's because he has all these weapons. It's because of this. It's because of that. The refs love him so much. It's one thing after another. We get the least calls when it comes to penalties that are you know opposed against us than probably pretty much anybody in the team or in the league. But he, you know, we're we're still we're we're you know now it's the Tom Brady uh, era where yeah. now Mahomes is getting the love that Tom Brady always got. That's absolutely not true. Chris Jones gets called for every everything he does but yet you can yank his jersey straight in the air and everybody in god's green earth can see it and nobody will call that hold so it's not a matter of having tyree kill and travis kelsey because that was the biggest thing we heard was oh well you know if I, we had travis kelsey if we had tyree kill well now you got tyree kill yeah okay now you know we've watched him play without both of those guys in the game and put up 36 points with guys that quote unquote, weren't the best wide receivers in the league. He made them better. And going to your point, I have said this on the show so many times, he makes everyone better around him. It's very rare that you see a quarterback that makes a defensive player want to play better and actually be better. But he does that. And that's something that's it's rare. It's it's rare and it's he does demand respect and he he gains it not by being a jackass, uh he does it on the field. He does it with the way he presents himself and the way he plays the game. Absolutely. That's something that you did. There was guys in the 90s, for everybody out there that's listening, there was guys in the 90s that liked him that just – they gained the respect because of who they were, how they played the game, the intelligence that they put into the game, and how much the work ethic that they put into it. Then you had guys in the 90s that wanted to demand their respect because they had – one or two good plays, then they thought they were up here. When they really weren't up there, they just got – they were in the right place. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. When you know to be in the right place, like Tim was, like a lot of guys were back in that day, then that's when you gain the respect. And you earned it. You earned that respect. It's not that you demand it. You earned it. And not too many people understand that it's it's just a different the game has evolved like you said i mean it's a totally different game than what we were used to i mean you played through marty ball i mean if you didn't run on fourth down that was kind of an anomaly but <clears throat> excuse me but um marty just loved to run the ball that was just something that he loved he believed in it and it worked for him to a degree it didn't get a ring but it came close yep. and uh Nowadays, you know, everybody wants to see the air attack. Everybody wants to see, you know, 70-yard bombs. You know, they love the 18, 19 Mahomes. People are complaining a little bit about the 21 Mahomes, 22 Mahomes, because, you know, he's he's not as, uh, as I put it, Brett Farvish. Um, you know, he's not launching balls just to get intercepted. He's methodically moving down the field. Right. And that's what, you know, you have to do to win in this game, in this league. It's not all about – drop in the 70 yard bomb. And if you get the chance, great, do it. But 
you also have to remember that things there's a progression behind it and he's he's done a good job of that and that's what i wanted your um input on as far as how it's changed so much and watching patrick mahomes that we god how lucky we are to get somebody that the first time we had drafted a quarterback hmm. since todd blackledge which we all know how that turned out um and then we get somebody like him right you know you, you're 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 probably at more games than you know and see and meet a lot more people than most what uh and your impression of him what do you think of him as far i mean i've everything you know he's seemed he's just a great guy all the way around he's he's an, a very uh, humble individual what do you think yeah yeah absolutely you know i've got to know him uh, off the field um uh, he's, he's not a um uh, he's a very unassuming guy uh yeah. he's not the one that's trying to you know, be the center of attention. Uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, that friendship that he has with Travis Kelsey, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Those two are inseparable. And the personality is Travis Kelsey. And Patrick Mahomes is kind of the sidekick guy when it's out in the social situations. Uh, you know, he, he just doesn't he doesn't crave that kind of attention. He doesn't crave, you know, to be the, uh, the life of the party. He's just a guy that's out there and he's doing his business and he's, you know, he's very nice. Uh, when you go and talk to him, he's very cordial, uh, looks you in the eyes. He cares about what you have to say. Uh, but, you know, he's not a really bombast, you know, big talker and over the over the top guy. He's just one of those guys that, you know, he's just one of us. If you were over at a restaurant or a bar or something and he was sitting over there and you went over and said hello, he'd say hello and talk to you. But. You know, he's he's not going to try to draw attention to himself. That's just not the way he rolls. Yeah. He's a really cool guy. And, I, and I, I'll leave you with this, J, JP. Um, um, Kansas City uh, is a special place to play. And you know that because you live yes. here. You've been around. Um, you know, they love their football. They love their Kansas City Chiefs. Um, you know, they're going to be there for you. But um, you really and truly have to uh, let them know that you care about what you're doing, too. Uh, not only on the field, but off the field. Yes. You got to be a part of the community, which Patrick is. Uh, you have to uh, assimilate into the community, which Patrick has. Uh, he lives here. He's here all year round. Now, yeah, he goes out and he goes back to Texas and he goes around. But he has a home here. He built another home here. And he's probably going to end up being around here. And, you know, that's what Kansas City loves. They want the Kansas City Chief players not only to come in here. They don't want to rent a player. They don't want a Jesse James that comes into town, steals the money and leaves. Exactly. They want somebody who wants to be invested in the community. And that's what I learned here when I've been here. That's why I've stayed. You know, I was drafted here in 1990 to a place I had no idea where I was going. I didn't know anybody here. And then, you know, 30 some years later, uh, you know, I have uh, built a, a great life here in, in Kansas City. My kids were all raised here in Kansas City. Uh, you know, I wrote a book for the Kansas City Chief fans, which I, they, they have enjoyed it and they bought into it. And great it's book. a great place to play, JP. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, it's a special place. And. And you probably know, too, from your podcast, you know, they eat up anything they can get, any kind of information, anything about their Kansas City Chiefs because they love them. Definitely, definitely. And I, I want to point out to everybody that's listening, Tim wrote, a, and I, I know you guys know now, He's we've mentioned it a couple of times, he wrote a book. Um, it's a great book. In fact, I have it right here, one of them. Um, I have two copies of this. Uh, View from Under the Center. You guys need to go out and get this book. Like Tim said, it is on his website, um, Tim Grun is it Tim right? Yeah. Tim Yeah. All and it's actually on Amazon. It's, it, yeah. but you're going to get a better deal. I think if you go to Tim's website and buy it directly, like he said, he'll give you, um, autograph. give you a little break on it and, and an autograph on it. Um, it's something that you, I think everybody needs to read. If you really want to know from somebody that's not going to hold back, this is the guy you want to hmm. know it from. I mean, He's never held back. I mean, I, I knew him back in the nineties and he didn't hold back then. I don't think he's going to hold back now. So <laughs> um, it just is what it is. Um, I've been uh, so I've, I've gotten through part of it and I've been so busy with all of this stuff that we're doing with, with cheese focus and getting it off the ground that I read it at night when I'm not uh, exhausted. And it's, it's it very intriguing. Um, it's crazy because some of the stuff that I, you, you mentioned in here, I already knew. And then some of it, I had no idea of. 
and I was really close to the team. So it's, it's crazy to, to learn the things that you have put into this. And I, I like I said, I, I was blown away that you wrote a book and I, I didn't expect it. Um, not that you, I didn't think you couldn't, <laughs> it was just, I didn't expect you to write a book. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you did. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. And he talks about everything from his days through today. So everybody needs to take, um, take the time, spend a little bit of cash, buy the book and read it. It's, it's a great book. So, so, so JP to let everybody know, uh, you know, they think that uh, being an ex NFL player or an NFL player is this life of glamor and luxury. Uh, right when I get off with you, I'm going to cut my mom's grass. So we'll just yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, we're, like, you know, it's so funny because it, <laughs> it, it cracks me up because I talk to so many players and <laughs> even from the background that I had, you know, it's a lot of guys just don't, they don't believe in all the, the hype and the, you know, I, you know, I got to be quote unquote Antonio Brown and right, have a driver with my Bentley and yeah. all this shit. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's mainly just being a normal human being. And that's Absolutely. the most guy, everybody that I have met through my years of being around sports for the most part, almost all of them were just normal guys, especially the guys in the nineties, guys like you, uh, guys like Derek, Derek, now don't get me wrong. Derek liked his toys. He did. And he had a nightlife for a while, but, uh, he, he did, <laughs> he seemed to learn from his mistakes and he was still an everyday guy. I mean, he was just a nice guy. So, but anyway, getting back, look, I really appreciate you coming on and, um, we definitely have to do this again, but when we get, when I get through this book completely and sadly enough, it's not a, it's not like a big giant Stephen King novel. I just don't have a lot of time Yeah, I and guess. my time is just cut down and I, it, it's especially right now, but, uh, the season always kicks my butt. Sure. But I love the book, what I've gotten through it, and I think everybody else will too. So for everybody out there, make sure you get go on Tim's uh, website. You get a signed autograph book, and it's a lot of knowledge, a lot of things that you would never, ever expect. And maybe it'll teach you something about the game. And you won't. For the guys out there that get so frustrated about Andy maybe not grabbing somebody at the deadline or, um, you know, a player may – Maybe you don't think he's playing up to his expectations. The one thing I've always said, and Tim, I'm sure you'll probably agree with me, you get to the NFL for a reason. There's not many guys that get into the NFL because they knew somebody or they just yeah, fell in. You know, you've got to – somebody saw – somebody had seen something in you to get you in that league. You may be in the wrong system. You may be in the right system. There may be something that just doesn't click with you. Maybe it's a position you're in. Tim switched positions. I mean, but you guys have to give some of these guys a little bit of a break because they're doing something that most people can never do. I would never be able to play Tim's position if I wanted to. So if I if I begged for it and I'm not, you know, I'm not the smallest guy in the world. It's just I don't think I could ever do it just simply because you got to be a special individual to play in that position. And you were the green dot of the offense. I mean, no matter how you look at it, you were the guy that ran the show when it came to that other than the quarterback and everybody looked up to you. So um, I don't know, man, I really appreciate you coming on and I'm sure everybody out here listening loved it. Um, but we will have to do this again. Make so, sure you jump on his web, uh, website, grab a book. It will teach you guys more than you think it will. And um, with that being said, man, again, I really appreciate you coming on and um, we will definitely have to do this again. All right. Well, thank you, JP. It's good talking to you guys. And uh, let's go, Chiefs. Let's go. All right. Thank you guys for joining in.